Hey everybody, welcome back to the One's Ready Podcast. You're in the team room and we have Morgan Houston with us. Appreciate you joining. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah, man. So you're a, a I guess, retired tech PE, right? I, I don't know. Separated. Is it, is it retired, I, I separated? I didn't stay in long enough to retire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yet you were a tech P though. That's um, right. Where'd you serve at? Um, I was in Vicenza, Italy with a... a <laughs> Yeah, I know. Tough life. Man. <laughs> yeah, it was good stuff. Yeah. You know, I just happened to be because of the convoluted path my pipeline took. I had to happen to go to jump school before I went to the schoolhouse. So I had an option to go and work with the 173rd Airborne Boys. Yeah. You weren't on that jump into uh, Iraq, were you? Um, I was the follow on guy. Were you? My boss was on the ground before the jump, and then the guys jumped, and then I was the next one in, um, working with all those. There was only so many planes. We had a, we had a lot of Air Force guys on that jump, though. A couple of cops and controllers, and it was great. Yeah, the uh, the the full story behind that whole jump is is pretty funny. We'll have to tell it at a different time. Unless <laughs> you, unless so, the you're a history buff. You're, you're yes. I mean, I would say you're a, you're a subject matter expert in history, everything Air Force Special Warfare. Um, so that's, I mean, you've been dropping knowledge and helping. That's the best thing is that you've been helping people out in Discord. Like you were one of the most active folks I've seen in Discord. So thank you for doing that. That's huge. It's it's great because like I was saying about doing this research, I, I can consider that part of my job. I, uh, I keep it on at work and, and I can chat with these young bucks and it doesn't really step outside the bounds of what I do every day. No, no, not at all. And I mean, and like I said, I, I enjoy history, but I don't have the, uh, the, the knowledgeable skill or at least even know where to start when it comes to history, because, Hey, if I, if somebody like you, you know, writes an article or something like that, and then I happen to see it, I'm like, Oh, well, I guess that's where, where, where everything originated from. But uh, you have the, the requisite skills to uh, deep dive into that. Well, you know, utilize the the resources that we have. When you get out, you know, you have all these great things like the GI Bill, vocational rehab. So I use that time to get a degree in history and then also get a degree, a master's degree in library science. And so I'm pretty good at research, you know. So <laughs> where are you working going. now? Um, I am currently the cataloger and veterans liaison librarian at Colorado Mesa University. Jeez, man. That's you cool. Were... I have Wikipedia. Does that count? <laughs> is that, is that Honestly, the same thing? In my classes, when I, t when I teach students, I say Wikipedia is a fine place to start. There's nothing wrong with that. They yeah. have all kinds of great citations. You can find all kinds of cool stuff, even about our jobs on Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I have heard that I, I think they're going away from, remember when you couldn't reference it, you couldn't cite it in there. I, from what I've been told, because it has been a little while since I was uh, writing papers in college, that you can, can you now cite Wikipedia in some instances? I would say, and if you're doing something based on like the internet, it would be kind of a relevant source. But if you're doing something like this, like history, probably not your best bet. Okay. Well, no. <laughs> we had a funny conversation with uh, Scott Zastro. So Scott came on and talked about his time in Afghanistan with the triple nickel. And, and it's more of a medicine thing, but it's, it applies to Wikipedia as well. They used to call Scott three deep because <laughs> they would tell him to go three references deep. So you can go to Wikipedia, but you go to the bottom and you see what they reference. And then in that reference, usually they reference another thing and you have to go three layers down. And if you go three deep, typically that is the, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Morgan, usually that is the academic standard for uh, the appropriate bedrock of references going three deep. That sounds great to me. I, I'm going to have to steal <laughs> that and use that in some of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like you, you look at any article that's written and you know you read something and you're like, I think this is trash. And then you flip to the end and you look at the references and you're like, okay, let me, let me go see where this guy got this. Uh, you definitely exactly. just hit the very first three references. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Let me get three deep here. So Morgan, what, is, what brought you into your interest in history? Cause I mean, that's, it's awesome. You know, uh, a couple of like hidden history pod, there's a couple other, you know, folks out there, late night history in the, in the circles that that stuff, just like peaches was saying, man, that's, it's amazing to me just because I, I read that stuff and I'm like, huh, I, I've never thought to be like, all right, let me dig down and, and figure out where all this stuff comes from. I think it actually stems for some of my, my interest actually joining the, the military as well. Um, and w I'm actually going to reference some of this a little bit later, but my family has a huge history of service. When After my family moved from Mexico, a lot of my 
my dad's uncles served in the military. A lot of them were in the Air Force when it became the Air Force. A lot of them were in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And so that family history made me interested in history, period. And then when I joined the Air Force in 2000, all I wanted to do at the time was be a combat controller because I didn't know about anything else. So after the year and a half of trying to do that, not making it, um, and then ending up in at the TACP schoolhouse and, you know, just you hear the 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 stories of of our legends. And then that just keeps building that, building that up. And then every time I'd get ready to go on a deployment, I'd want to know everything I could about that space. So when we were going to Iraq, I was reading about ancient Mesopotamia and and the the Silk Road and the tra- the transfer of knowledge between Europe and and Baghdad. And then when we go to Afghanistan, it'd be the same thing about how it's the graveyard of empires and, you know, all of these things. And I just, I just kept voraciously reading and I couldn't get enough of it. And then when I got out after about a year after I got out, I was still trying to find my space. And I found out that, you know what, I have, I have stuff I can go and the government's going to pay for my degrees. And I went to Metro State University of Denver and got my first degree history. And found some really great professors that would teach you that would just explain to you that history is not about the what and the when that's important but it's about the how and the why and then so it just it just kept feeding me and feeding me and feeding me and then after enough time kind of separated from the community I was like well I just kind of want to see what's up how you know I'd been doing mostly history on early medieval christianity and I was like no no I don't want to do this anymore I want to do stuff on air power I want to do stuff on bombs and I want to do stuff on on Jays and all this kind of stuff that, you know, it's out there, but it's really hard to get out to the people. People don't know about us. People don't know what we are, what we do, how much of an impact that we've had on the, on the world. And so as I found you guys started listening to your podcast and then COVID hit. And as I was on a furlough for the job, I started the Air Force Special Warfare History Instagram and blog and yep. follow it, but I'm not real good on Instagram. So I'll post <laughs> mostly other people's stuff. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and then it's just always been something I've continued to do. And then as I became a librarian, it was mostly to help other people find information. That's kind of a, a space where I'm at as a, as a librarian is I help other people find information, but in the process, I find stuff as well. And I'm slowly working on this. I, my hopeful goal is to write the TACP history book, like literally. So that's kind of where we're at with that. That'd be a big move. So pararescue, it's been in my career. It was when I, I don't know if it was, if I was in the pipeline or if it was like really shortly after I graduated the pipeline, they they put out 50 years of pararescue. So they Mm -hmm. put out the the first real history book where everybody sort of collaborated and and told their stories and stuff. And that really sparked our specific career field to, to make more of a history of it, which is, which is a good thing. Take me back to when you were deploying, you know, as a young airman, as that, that young staff sergeant, as you're getting ready to go. How did knowing the history of an area help you in your follow-on deployments? You know, I think one of the things that we as as airmen are tasked with is to be the critical thinkers. You know, we're we're not we're so young when we roll out with a team. Like you're interacting as a I was a senior airman on my first deployment, and I'm there with a captain, major, sometimes even colonel and general. And having a knowledge base of like, hey, when we're planning this air support that for you guys, maybe we shouldn't, you know, think of this as a good target set because this is culturally important to to our people. And, you know, that was a big thing during Iraq, right? Hearts and minds, hearts mm-hmm. and minds. And so as we started thinking about that kind of stuff, you know, I remember sitting in Erbil at the um, Siege of Soda North Talk and watching um, the looting of the museums. And it just kind of hurts my heart as a historian, mm-hmm. like, ugh. I don't want to see this, but like you can see what it is that the people were seeing, they were freeing this legacy. And like, you can see how important a space and a place is to people. And it, it should inform your decision-making process. Now, now, granted, if you're getting shot at and like, you don't have an option, you know, cleared hot is great. Two words, you know, but yes, it, um, is. <laughs> it really is. But I think it, at times what it is, and it was, it was especially important when I was in Afghanistan in 05 and we showed up right as a national election was happening. So there was a lot of cultural relevance that was needed. And, and you know, people, even if you don't know your own history, you're immersed in your history just through the society that you grew up in. So when you understand the 
the place that you're in it. I think it helps us make better decisions. Yeah, uh, it, you see it both ways too. So, you know, just as it's valuable to understand, hey, these are, you know, culturally specific areas, or this is a culturally specific structure, you see it on the other side of warfare too. Like, what are mm -hmm. the first thing that a, con a conquering, you know, force does is they try to erase that history, because that's the mm -hmm. link that provides you with your customs, your culture, your values, your morals, your link to those generations that went by it's really important for humans to connect with that so you know there's always something about history where you're like oh wow this is you know these are just stories this mm -hmm. is where we came from and this is important to us how did you yeah. did you always have that in you like when you were younger did you always like value history or i know you talked a little bit about your parents and and you know your uncles serving um you know in the military and that's how you got there but you know when when did you first realize like man you're a history buff <laughs> i think my first journey on the, or my first step on the journey to become a historian was um, the Gulf War um, in 91. I think I was nine at the time. And it's just, you know, it was the first really televised war that we'd ever really had. And just sitting there watching it. Now, granted, this is a, a thing that happened. But you're watching as, you know, the 82nd Airborne or the 101st or, or, you know, a bunch of long tabbers are going out there doing like righteous stuff, right? And then you just want to know more about them. You know, I'm reading the newspaper, watching CNN, and then, you know, going to the local library and trying to figure out what I can do, what I can find out about it. And it's just the more I the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. And I think that's kind of where it was. It was just something that was. It's really interesting because that's like really one of the first real memories of world events that was hitting to me as a, as a child. And so, you know, you want to know why these things happen. And like, I, you couldn't articulate it at that age. But now as I look back and be like, well, you know, why did this happen? And then especially in 03, like, why are we back? You know, like all these things. So like, there's all the, the, you know, we can't make decisions about the now without the past. And then we can't make decisions about the future about understanding the now, which requires us to understand the past. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you hear, history repeats itself, but I, I don't necessarily know it repeats itself fully. I think maybe it rhymes, mm -hmm. but I think it, it's important. I think a good because way to put it. Can, yeah. Cause then you can see where, see where you messed up, see what historically has failed or has succeeded, but then knowing the history of a place will also help you. And I'm thinking of it as kind of the, the example that you gave with Iraq. You know, or or you can even even say Afghanistan. Like it was insane to think that we could go in there and create a democracy. Like mm -hmm. what? Well, I mean, they put down the Brits, they put down the Raj, they put down the the Soviets, and then you know, because it's really not a group. It's not one people. It's a group of like seventy five people. And so yeah. you're trying to con 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 <laughs> It was never militarily that the issue was our issue. It was all the other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, we should have been better than Alexander the Great, but if I'm if I'm historically accurate here, I believe that's where his great conquest ended up stalling was in the Hindu Kush. You're not wrong, and also it's kind of hard to live up to a guy whose literal name is the Great. The yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's what my mom was going to name me Aaron the Mediocre, but uh, it was no, I stole that one first. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, man, I so I, I'm at a crossroads right now. Do we mm -hmm. do we keep having the, the chat about about history? Because I mean, we could just keep on going like this, or do we dive into uh, the history of CCT? Like, I, I'm I'm game for whatever you want to do. I mean, I'm, I can go either way. I've got I've got ten pages of notes here that we can we can chat. Let's okay, go. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Let's go into that because ten pages is a lot. Right. <laughs> well, like I, I was saying before we started, like that. This is just only a a little bit. There's okay. whole books being written. Um, well, so, I don't know where to to kick you off, so just yeah, jump right the into beginning. it. Dude. This is the third time you say it. Where do you start with history? At the beginning. At the beginning. Jared. Well, oh. and so, the, or, the origin story. Come on, guys, it's twenty twenty three. Yeah, the or, well, the origin, origin story, story. It's one that I think um, is for me is a little bit different than what most people think, um, because I like to think about it as where do we look as air power impact special operations, and to me, that is actually pre World War One. When we're talking about the um, punitive expedition, which is the hunt for Pancho Villa, right? Like that seems a little bit beyond our normal scope. But if you think about it, that was the first time that biplanes and balloons were being used for artillery spotting 
and reconnaissance. So kind of that, you know, that JTAC and SR kind of mission was happening there when we were hunting for, you know, a non-state aligned actor. Sounds kind of familiar to some of the things that we've done. <laughs> and so like it was really there as we're observing and as we're doing reconnaissance and, and directing artillery fire. And then, you know, after world, not long after that, World War One started happening. We started using our aircraft in more ISR roles, you know, moving forward. And then World War One being a trench warfare, there's not really a lot there, but it really kicks off as we evolve. And we start operating and decide to move during World War II beyond North Africa. You know, so we're establishing, as they called it back then, airdromes and airheads. You know, what? but what are we doing with this new thing called airborne forces? The, the Germans have effectively dropped troops. You know, what are we going to do as allies supporting our teams? And well, as we began in 1942, there was the creation of the Air Transport Command, which for the Army Air Forces, you can kind of f follow this kind of circuitous link from that to Military Airlift Command. And this is where the kind of the beginnings of true AFSPEC war history begins. So we're looking to move past Sicily onto the mainland of continental Europe. And as the plans continue, well, how do we direct airplanes? We're looking at, at having thousands of troops drop into very tight valleys of mountainous Italy. So, well, we've got this technology called Rebecca and Eureka, which are beacons. The Rebecca, Rebecca beacon and the, or the Eureka beacon and the Rebecca receiver on the plane. Well, how do we get that there? Well, the decision was made that we are going to create some Army Air Force guys pathfinders you know it's a fairly common term that we now know but this is actually the 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 kernel of what we now see as combat control so as we move forward what we have is the two salerno drops there's the one on the Sealy river and one in avellino the Sealy river drop was actually one of the most successful drops in world war ii um it was on the 13th of september um of oh where's my notes oh that's 1942 sorry um and there was three pathfinder teams that were that were set out um they were using two eureka beacons and um the second one was kind of used in reserve and once the team got on the ground and set up the beacon they were able to direct aircraft to drop 1300 paratroopers within one mile of the dz that's like that's ridiculous. a fairly successful that jump right <laughs> Imagine 1,300 of your closest friends just showing up for their first ever. Can you imagine being a jumper on that first one? Because literally, like, there's not a lot of trade. We've all seen Band of Brothers, right? We've all mm -hmm. seen, like, the, the lead up to kind of some of these some of these early things. We think, you know, static, like, like we poo-poo static line jumping where we're like, oh, great, static line. I'd rather be doing free fall. <laughs> but imagine these dudes that have never done it before. They were like, all right, listen, we have this radio transponder. And it's a beacon and there's another one on the plane. And that's how the plane's going to figure out how to get to where we are on the ground. And then you guys, you're going to jump out of the plane and everybody's like, Hey, hold up. What? <laughs> and there's going to be 1300 of you. What made it even more difficult is because these aircraft were, were flying out of um, North Africa. So they had to cross the med. And so they were oh, trying man. to make visual references on Sicily before they made their turn to get to basically what is, you know, Naples. And so as, as they make these turns, they, there's actually quite a few aircraft that just didn't even make the drop because they couldn't oh, find their, their, their references in Sicily. So it's like, <laughs> so they just, they just like turned around that that's another hilarious thing. Well, it's not hilarious, but it just shows like how far we've come. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about other things in, uh, in history, like, you know, the Pegasus bridge and the glider operations and, mm -hmm. you know, operation, um, I'm blanking on the name. I'll think of it in a second. But, you know, the World War II drops where they had, you know, glider <laughs> insertions. They'd be like, well, you know, if we if we really get, you know, a fifth of the forces, a half of the forces there, that's a that's a, a resounding success. You'd be like, hold on, wait, we're going to lose half of these planes. They're like, well, I mean, I hope not, but I think so. Jeez. Yeah. And that that Eureka, I just Googled the Eureka and Rebecca thing. That thing's easily the size of a ruck maybe maybe a third of a ruck or i'm sorry th uh three quarters of a ruck by looking well, that's, at that thing that's why they were jumping uh the pathfinder teams were uh at least two if not four four bubba's right so 
one of the, the continuing threads on combat controllers is that before they became kind of the operators that they are today, like, what do they do? Who are they? What kind of job are they? And so there's, there's concerns about like their security. Right. So like, and it's also, and this is kind of ties in with the next, like the next Lerno drop in uh, Avellino, which is a, um, a more mountainous Valley, which is hard. So it's like, they're, they're actually dropping the pathfinders very close to when the jumpers are going and they didn't have the beacons. So they weren't, they were thinking that we could, you know, and we haven't established these, these TTPs. We haven't established any of these things that were, well, what happens when the beacon goes down? Who do we talk to? Who do we send in? And at this point, we're just sending paratroopers who have had maybe three weeks of training, Jeez. you know? And so like, we're like, well, we're at war boys. So, Hey, can you turn this switch on and pull out the equivalent of a VS 17 panel and talk to a plane? Maybe. All right, cool. Go jump out. Go get them. <laughs> you know, go get them. And it was so they they weren't using our beacon. We were using a British beacon, which you know it's it's one of the you know we talk about the soft truths and you know humans are more important than hardware, but sometimes good hardware really helps. You know, so it's like they were able to get troops there, but like only half of them landed within five miles of the DZ. So. <laughs> They actually had to have the guys from the the Sele drop come and rescue some of them. So, like, guys who had just dropped about um, two days earlier were walking about 15 miles to come and find people and direct them to where they needed to be so they could continue the assault on Italian and Nazi forces. It was It was incredibly wild, right? But it's – the thing is, is that – so there was a total of three drops within three days, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. The 13th and 14th were the drops on Sele. Those were awesome. They were successful. Literally 90% of the droppers were within at least a mile of the DZ. The Avellino one, not so great. But even then, because of the success of the Pathfinder teams, they actually created a whole you know, series of specialized Pathfinder units that were going to be used. Um, and they also included using them in some of the glider teams, like you were mentioning, Aaron. Um, one of the the more um, the more interesting ones was on twenty fourth of March nineteen forty five. Our Operation um, Varsity, they dropped some a team of four pilots and one enlisted dude. And this was a this was as they were testing out these Pathfinder teams, they couldn't figure out the balance of of forces. Was this going to be an officer thing? Was this going to be an enlisted thing? And then, so the the senior pilot of the four f actually flew the glider. The other three were to help direct run the radios. And then this is kind of where it's funny as, as you watch these, these path, the paths of these career fields, you see so much overlap between TACP and CCT, right? So the, the one enlisted guy was a radio repairman. You know? Nice. So we're, we're going to question about the officers is how did they jump in the typewriters? Because I assume that they didn't go anywhere without. You know that. Well, that was what that was with the, when the E's rock, man. They had him had that typewriter form. That's right. Got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why is my ruck so heavy? Because I have a typewriter and all the ribbons. Yes, I, I've uh, got to start writing my memoir now. Enlisted man, I need to write a book. <laughs> but no, this the, and this one was where the the glider one was interesting because they actually in, sent a couple gliders in that included some infantry security teams for these guys. Because they weren't sure, because they were all pilots, so their you know ability to defend themselves was kind of limited, and so they were they were really concerned. But um, this was um, they landed, they established themselves, and they controlled um, air traffic for forty eight hours. You know, so it was, it was really something interesting. You know, it was one of the things, and I, I think what what made it interesting too is that these the, this particular team was also the center for uh recovery operations for downed air crew so mm. kind of the through line i think between the hit in the history of all the the career fields is collaboration coordination and working as a team right so it's like there's you can't do one without the other like you can but we all work better together so that's one of the most interesting things it's like as the uh, any time that an aircraft was, would get shot down, it would be the the Pathfinder team there on the Rhine that would help direct and find them and use the aircraft as 
ISR and then direct any kind of recovery of efforts. Well, and those were really, an, it's funny. Go ahead. I, I think it's an important through line to today too, because, you know, people today, you know, in our, in our circles, they get stuck on what is a CCT? What is a PJ? Mm -hmm. What is a TACP? What are, you know, what are these career fields where, you know, what you just said, you had an emerging capability and an emerging threat, and then you found a way to fix that problem with capability. And that's, you know, you're talking about these things and I'm like, oh, so they had a PRCC. Oh, so they had mm -hmm. a, you know, a recovery team on the ground. Oh, so they figured out how to control from the ground, uh, not only, you know, aircraft, but, um, you know, eventually we're going to work our way into fires here. That's completely the opposite of what folks on the internet are doing today. We're like, oh, well, a CCT needs these certain things or they're not a combat controller. But like, no, 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 that's not what we're, that's not what we're talking about. When we talk force projection, we might need an airman that can do Air, air traffic control or special reconnaissance or provide a specific capability to the ground. And people are so pigeonholed into that. Like, that's not how we figured the, that's not how we were born. That's not, that's not, you know, you have teams, specialized teams in the army where the army is like, oh, well, we got aircraft. Oh, sweet. Well, how can we use these aircraft? Oh, we can insert people now. Well, if we can insert people, what happens if they go down? What happens if we got to go find them? What happens? And if you back it all the way up, how are we going to train these people to survive, to survive or evade mm -hmm. or resist or escape. Like I can, I can hear all of these different capabilities like popping up as you're talking through the history. hundred percent. I think, I think that's also another point why it's, it's important to know these things, right? Cause sometimes our solutions are in our past. We forget them, right? Mm -hmm. Because we get so focused on what we're doing now. Like that's why I, I, I love the, the, the expanse of the global access mission right now. I think that's like, we're seeing in, we can look in the past and see these things that combat controllers have done. We've been doing, you know, you guys mostly doing, you know, JTACery, but which you guys are great at, but like, that's a unique capability. But like if, when you put, and then you put it all together with J's and TAC P's and SR guys, and we can do all these <laughs> things that, you know, we just didn't have to do necessarily, but like the, the yeah, PR yeah, stuff, sure. I think we, we complement each other very, very well. It's what makes it so interesting, and I think that you know we can all go ones and, and go support the army, but I think together too we're we're just as capable. So, mm -hmm. but speaking of rescue, this is when we get into some really interesting, not only PJ history, but even some precursors to Sauce T. Like I found a little bit of everything, guys. And just just so you know, <laughs> go, dude, go ham. So the the as been referenced multiple times, Burma is one of the big spaces for for what at the time would have been called paradoctors. Um, the, the fall of Burma, it led to some of the largest mass air evacuations of World War II. In for, 1943, the deployment of a, of a team for, um, to rescue downed crews in the jungles of Burma was created. Um, this team was Passy and McKenzie. No mm -hmm. big deal. J-Mac and uh, another one of our friends. So, you know, those, uh, those cats. Yep. So I, you just preempted me there, Aaron. So yes, got him. Great got podcast me. hosting. Interrupt your yep. guess as he's getting to his point. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But, but what made this this the jump so interesting with with you know, so Flickinger had jumped, but the two enlisted medics, um, Passy and, and McKenzie had not never made a single jump before. They're just like, Yeah, I'll go. Right. Yeah. Classic me. PJ stuff. Are you right. guys trained for this? Nah, dog, we'll figure it out. So but I we'll found this work. really interesting quote from the dude that they rescued. And he said, um, of their own free will, men were coming to help us, voluntarily casting their fate with ours. I got to the crest of the steep slope for the first jumper floated past, missing the summit by a scant few yards. I could see the insignia of a lieutenant colonel on his, on his shoulders. He grinned at me and I said, foolishly, hey, we're here in the village. He held up a finger in a crisp gesture uh, like a man strolling past on a sidewalk and said in a conversation tone, be there with you in a minute, <laughs> which I think was fantastic because he's like, hey, yeah, I see you, bud. I'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> be there shortly. Right. I, I, I also imagine like a hand running through some hair, you know, like it's it, it had to That's happen implied. at some point, you yeah. know. But like, it's just like he, after, you know, eventually as this quote continues, he roll, you know, he just rolls up after, after he collects his guys, goes, I'm Don Flickinger. I'm the wing surgeon. Saw you need a little help. Like, I mean, that's gangster back then. That's, that's gangster. Now. Gangster, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that gangster right this second. Yeah. <laughs> so they, the, the team cared for, for the, those who had survived the crash. Um, 
And what, what made this even more J is the fact that they went against orders to do this. Like they just said, no, I'm going to go and save some people. So like that, like to me, it's like if there's one thing that is just like, nope, this this comes first. I got to I got to go save people. I don't care what you say. That's always kind of been like at the forefront of being a PJ for me. So it's just like, yeah, that it just it hits in a certain yeah. way. We bear considerable watching left to our own devices. We will go do random jump missions. You'd be like, where'd the team go? Be like, oh, they're out jumping. They're out doing what? The, uh, <laughs> the other interesting thing about that rescue is that, um, you know, not only did they get there on the ground in Burma, stabilize everybody and treated people that they needed to treat, but they had like a month long walkout. Mm -hmm. Like the walk out at, to actual like friendly controlled, they didn't have a way to get out. That's why they had to jump in. So they, they actually had to you know walk out with these folks for uh, upwards of a month. It was but a that month. actually, because they, they walked out, that actually led to the creation of an airborne surgical suite in, in Burma. Um, they created uh, an entire suite in the back of a C-47. The, um, the assistant wing surgeon for the Army Air Forces in, in the Pacific, um, Major Julian, and um, and then a couple of uh, intelligence officers and um, some medics um, were assigned to to this team. And what they would do is they would stay on the radio, and as they would hear about these things, they would you know do a quick map in, uh, map recce and try and find an airfield, and then they would fly that that surgical suite out, walk in to, and go pick people up, and then bring them back. And then as they were flying to um, field expedient hospitals, they would be operating on these people. And it was as they're flying. And, not, and it's like people, you know, today have no idea what it's like to fly in some that rickety. Like is someone, they, they have um, in Denver, they have some, some like of the old B, the bombers and the C-47s that fly around. And I got, got to ride on. And, mm, no, thank you. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. Not one bit. Um, I don't even like landing already. And then you're in that thing. No, thanks. So like these guys are like hands, steady hands are, are you know, elbows deep in, in human beings as they're trying to save people as they're flying in the most rickety aircraft ever known to man. So it's just like, it's, it's wild. Like, I, I don't even understand. Like, you know, people say it to us, like, I don't know how you did. It. I'm like, I don't know how these guys did it. Like I had mm -hmm. it easy. Like I had stuff. These guys right. were making stuff to make it happen. So like standing on the shoulders of giants is like an understatement. And it's just like they were they were able to get people with to people within 40 minutes of receiving the call because they were they were able to fly out there. They were able to get to the area and be, at least begin the mission, if not get there, because they were able to create this this airborne surgical street. It's it's unreal. The stories that, that you can read. There's insanely a whole book. fast. Oh, my God. It's so fast. There's a there's an entire book on um, Army Air Force medical support in Bur China, Burma, India, that is just like 500 pages of like heroism. It's unreal to to try and be pulling this stuff. But what I think was really cool about this too is that um, because of this, they were creating teams. They were thinking about doing this for the long term, and in um, here in Colorado where I'm at, they were testing paradoctors on Alpine Search and Rescue. So they were they were creating teams and training them here where they could um, they could go and they they would learn the skills. And they had eventually had six doctors in 1944 that were trained in both parachuting and Arctic survival and search and rescue. And they were they were kind of spread out through the country, but they would come here and they would train here with the 10th Mountain when the 10th Mountain was here in in, in the Mount, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So they would they could jump and then they could do medicine. I really good time. Time article of all things on it in 1944. You know the things that you can find when you're doing research. On the history. article was from Time Magazine in 1944. Magazine. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. The Google machine is spectacular. It's just a matter <laughs> of you know parsing out what's true and not which. Hey. And, and getting the right prompts. Yep. Got to get them get right it. prompts, baby. So I mean, just in that, basically, you know, between 42 and 45, we see the creation of what will become. You know, probably one of the most um, decorated groups of men in all of history, you know, because they decided, I see someone down, I'm going to rescue them. And that's kind of what started on to our things. But to me, the actual most interesting story of World War II is the Yugoslavia caper. And this is for our Sao TSR brothers, you know. So in uh, in the the 
kind of initial spots of the war before we've invaded in France. We're, we're operating out of parts of um, parts of Italy. The 19th Weather Squadron had some of their men co-opted to the OSS, and they were de- having uh, having them dropped into Yugoslavia to provide weather observations for the possibility of an invasion through Yugoslavia. Um, we get our most of the story from a Captain Charles Height. Um, thanks to the Grey Beret Association for finding this and putting it up on their website. You can go and read this account. It's absolutely spectacular. You you know, you think, oh, they're just weather guys, right? No, these guys were bad, man. So they were like, they had around eight teams. They were, their whole pur- purpose was to supply, you know, people for weather teams, the equipment, so they could send tra- uh, weather transmissions um, with, you know, secure communications in ciphered in decipher things. Um, and they were to communicate and, you know, the basic idea was that they were trying to see if, if they were, um, if it was feasible to either an airborne or land invasion into Yugoslavia and open up an Eastern front on, um, through the, the, the Americans come to find out though, part of this was a grand psyop was that they were dropping these teams to misdirect German forces away from the D-Day invasions. And so, again, kind of in the same vein as some of the, 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 these medical providers, there wasn't necessarily an okay for our Army Air Force weather guys to go to Yugoslavia. The OSS came and said, hey, we need weather guys. You're a weather guy. Do you want to come? And he's like, yeah, Hop that sounds in. cool. <laughs> oh, okay, we're going to send you to Africa to go to jump school. You're going to jump, and then we're going to drop you into Yugoslavia. And there was Sounds a, tight. It, I'm in. Yeah, right. And it was, I think there was like 20 to 30 guys that eventually had made the jump into Yugoslavia to provide weather, weather observations back to the OSS office in Italy. Like, that's wild. Like, and who's heard of that before? Right? Like, I'm like, well, I, don't, I don't know about this Sao Tea thing. And then, you know, the guys who were running the Grey Beret Association webpage and, and Instagram page are killing it because they're dropping a ton of knowledge that, like, I'm like, man, I got to double check this. This seems it's so <laughs> this out seems- there. You're like, this, this can't be right. And they're like, God, it's right. It's right. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. Just unbelievable. The things that these guys were doing. Well, that was, and that's the thing is that them, you can, everybody that was doing things back then, and <clears throat> there was a lot less red tape then. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot more, like we, we always talk about, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, you know, don't let anybody hold you back kind of thing. But those, those folks back then really did that. Whereas now, and and I think we are starting to kind of go that direction in a way, but they're still, you know, as great as, as the last, you know, 20 years or whatever of OEF, OIF, you know, all all of the O's, right. Mm -hmm. We got in some comfort zone of, always have to have isr you always have to have these these certain things and you're like hey man we we did this a lot especially like in the beginning we did this without isr we did this without these things you just entrusted us to go out there you entrusted your senior ncos and your commanders to actually you know do the right thing and 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 operate and uh I think we're going to have like if mm-hmm. if things take a turn in the bad direction uh in certain areas of the country like we're going to have to be comfortable with that because yeah. there's not going to be 20 ISR platforms hanging out overhead doing stuff. You're just going to yeah. have to get comfortable with the the mission type orders and commander's intent and you move out. Yeah, that, well, the Morgan, idea of, of having to operate with you can't leave the wire without something watching you overhead is Yeah. We got it. We got to get rid of that mindset. Well, and it's, it's everything. Like, and I think you, you said it perfectly is sometimes your answers are in the past, right? Mm-hmm. When I would go out, you know, in the middle of GWAT and people wanted me to carry a huge Pelican case so that I could send sipper email, sit rep <laughs> updates every single day. Like that never happened before. We took Bastone on a damn telegraph. It was like, take the Bastone, stop. Tell me when you're done. Stop. And that was it. You know, when we started talking about, you know, all the things that we're looking at now, like these problems of, oh, well, in a true contested denied environment, how are people going to do PR? You're like, well, uh, you're not going to talk to me for a couple of weeks. You're going to send a team out. We're going to go to an area. We're going to service this site. 
we're going to pick up this person or this piece of equipment, and then we're going to come back. Well, yeah, but you're not going to have ISR and you're not going to have anything overhead. Oh, do you mean like Vietnam? Do you <laughs> mean like in the triple canopy jungle when we would just put people in with a lensatic compass and they would navigate to somebody from a last known location and they went and did search and then it did rescue? Like, yeah, you're not going to be able to ping me every two seconds from your temperature controlled, you know, trailer, <laughs> wherever it is you're sitting. We're just like, we know how to do that. It's just, we've become so accustomed to this instant and instantaneous feedback loop that it, it is, it, it's, it's almost like blinding us to the, the situation, yeah. which is right there, which is again in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, and like the rest, the rescue, you know, that that's always been there. You know what we need to do. It's like it's always been a thought process of how how do we how do we go and uh, how do we rescue our downed air crews, and you know and we you know you know for I'm probably gonna piss off some people here with this next statement, but whatever. Um, I don't think rescue as we know it now really started in Vietnam. I think <gasps> it started in Korea. <gasps> how dare you? Right, because as um, so, there's a great series of books that are to celebrate the the 50th anniversary of the Korean War. Um, one of them is written by the historian of the com of combat controllers. His name is Dr. Forrest Marion. He wrote Brothers and Berets. If you haven't read that book, read that book. It's basically the history of special tactics from World War II to um, to 2003. It's it's amazing. But he also wrote a book called That Others May Live: Air Rescue in Korea. And this is where probably my favorite bit of the hundred plus hours I've read stuff in, in the past month, getting ready for this. Um, I learned that my great uncle is a predecessor to a PJ. Nice. His name is at the time he was corporal Homer Ramirez um, on 24 January, 1951, a B-26 radio that it had intention to crash at an enemy held airstrip in Suwon, Korea. Um, the third rescue squadron or air rescue squadron sent to H5 helicopters, which anyone seen that um, those things are rickety, <laughs> scary yeah. looking. Um, the, shouldn't the, be flying. Right. So the, the helicopters were, shouldn't fly. They're just yeah, so they ugly. Were, the earth repels them. <laughs> yeah. So the, these um, H5s were flown by uh, two lieutenants, a Lyndon Thompson and an Osborne McKenzie. And they were accompanied by medics, corporals, Homer Ramirez and Carl Poole. Um, a couple of, Marine Corps Corsairs provided air cover to keep the enemy he heads down while the H5 crews rescued three crew members a mere 20 minutes after they landed. And so I'm reading this book and I'm like, that's a pretty unique name. I'm pretty sure I know that. <laughs> hey, Pops, you know, I'm here with my, my folks. I'm like, hey, hey, Pops, um, Theo Homer, he's a, he was in the Air Force, right? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was a medic, right? Yeah. So like, Finding out that before we even called ourselves AFSPEC War, my family has an over 50 year history tied in with it is like the that's just dope. Right. Like, and he, I, I would joke, I'm, I'm a mediocre attack P. Like, I was an okay attack P. <laughs> probably why I got out after six years. Right. He is a freaking hero, dude. <laughs> like, he's rescuing dudes down behind in an enemy controlled airfield. And like, we don't know what helicopter uh, rescue looks like. So as the the air rescue squadrons and the air rescue and recovery services becoming a thing, this is the daily task of them, right? As we are operating within the frozen mountains of Korea, the the swampy lands is the the and the Chinese and the North Koreans are coming at us. You know, the you can only fit four people in these helicopters total. So you're getting a pilot a medic and maybe two patients. Right. And this is before the, the next one comes to H19. Like these are unbelievable. These things that these, these heroic things. And like, we don't have PJs. We just have medics at this point. The, the only thing that separates these guys from anything is that they can maybe fire from an air, from an aircraft. You know, they, they're, they volunteer to go on probably one of the most dangerous things that leaves the earth, you know, at the time. And it's just like, I've got list after list as the list. And the, the idea was that, you know, the, the, the creation of the air rescue service was that we're, we're here to, to rescue down air crew in Korea. But, well, we can't always rescue someone. Well, we're bored. Oh, there's a, uh, a soldier who just got shot and he needs to go to a mass unit. We'll go get him. 33% of all personnel recovery of wounded people in, in Korea were done by the air rescue service, considering that was their third mission. 
It was rescue of downed air crew, special operations, and then pickup of wounded soldiers. Jeez. So like this is where what we now recognize as PR began. Like we've coalesced around how do we find these things? And it's just there's struggles to get these things working. Like how do how do we take these kind of rickety, not so great at flying helicopters and our crew in it? Do we use them? How do we use them to recover components of a MiG-15, which they did in Korea? You know, sensitive item recovery. Um, how do we how do we use them to pull uh, civilians out of a flood um, around um, Seoul, which they did? Like this is all being done in a three year span in Korea. That is just it's unbelievable. And to make it even wilder, um, there was a heap of rescues that were done by seaplanes with medics on it. They had an SA-16 aircraft, which is a sea, a sea land capable plane where you can, they would land in rivers and plains and, or in the ocean and pick up Navy, downed Naval crews and injured, injured um, soldiers and fly them back to, it's like, the I was like, Albatross, I, huh? Yeah, yeah. I didn't even realize that we had seaplanes at one point in the Air Force, <laughs> you know, like how did this thing even happen? Right. The crazy thing is the evolution as well. So when you talk about Korea and you talk about, you know, these things, if you, if you think about, again, we have a, we have a need, we're going to evolve into that need and then it's going to become, you know, whatever that crew member that was on the back of that H five, that initial, you know, medic, well, he was also a gunner. He was also a scanner. He was also a crew member. He was also a survival expert because they figured out they're like, we're going to be on the ground with these guys for a long time. And then as the plane, you know, if you think of it as, as the helicopters got more capable and we started moving towards the H-47, we started moving, you know, towards, um, you know, some of these bigger aircraft, you could fit more people on it. And they were like, oh, well, now we have actual gunners and actual mm -hmm. crew members and flight engineers that can sit on the back of there. So PJs, you don't have to do that anymore. Now you're just a survival expert and a medic and a special operator that can get off these planes and go get these people. And then they were like, hey, we don't have enough time to focus on the survival aspect. We should make an entire other career field that just focuses on preparing air crew. Cause PJs used to do that in the mm -hmm. air recovery service and the air rescue and recovery service. That was the PJs job was training the, the pilots and the air crew that they worked with. So no kidding from that single, you know, need for a capability, that need for rescue, we had whole career fields that would pop up because they were like, Oh man, we thought that we would, you know, one person could do this. Well, then as, you know, Korea happened, exactly what you said, all these different environments, all these different places, you're like, wait, this is, this is too big for one career field. We, we need somebody that's just going to focus on getting off the aircraft, getting to the patient, treating them and getting them back. So I can't do the survival part anymore. I don't have enough time in my day. And I can't do the, I, I PJs used to know, I mean, they were uh, responsible for sitting in the left door. Like that, that happened way up yeah. until like late nineties, mm -hmm. you know, my first team sergeant was still sitting in a door at a weapon school as you know, the PJ, he wasn't a gunner. He wasn't an FE. He was a PJ that was sitting in the left door. Um, but that's the, the evolution of all this stuff that happened is just amazing because the, the mission was there and we needed people that could focus on it full time. And it's really interesting to see, you know, from the very beginning, be like, I don't know, throw a, throw a dude that can stop some bleeding on the aircraft and he's going to have to pick up other stuff. But like, Again, we look at multi-capable airmen today and people are like, oh, this new multi-capable airmen concept. They're like, hey, new dog. We've been doing that doing for, it for a while. Yeah, doing it well, for a while. And part of this whole thing, too, is the is the continued through line of collaboration and, and coordination between the career fields. Because as we are trying to find down airmen, we have our FAC, FAC A's and the Mosquito Planes who are coordinating. But we also have TAC P's at this point where we have rated pilots who are on the ground with a Jeep. And uh, three airmen who are with them, two radio operators and a, ra and a radio repairman who are out there directing airstrikes. And then when they see something go down, they're talking to the H-5s. They're talking to the H-19s to direct them towards the area where the crews are. And like this is as we are developing what actual close air support is. Because in World War II, we actually did have a lot of close support when it comes to aircraft. But the problem is, is that it didn't have what we would consider like the doctrinally correct definition. There wasn't detailed integration, right? There was not a dude on the ground talking to the planes because we didn't necessarily have those capabilities. In Korea, we did. So this is when we start seeing TACP is created. This is like TACP has a long history of being in Korea, right? Like we've got guys there now. We have a whole group out there, TACPs. Well, at one point, there was 60 TACP teams in Korea. 
that were supporting Jeez. two different cores. And it was it was wild. And the, and the history of TACP when it comes to Korea is unbelievable. Um, we see a, like it's some of those things where I'm reading, I'm like, God damn, things haven't changed. Things have not changed, right? Like generals, army generals trying to take control of the cast mission saying, no, that's ours. We're doing it now. We're, we want to be like the Marine Corps. Like, but sir, you don't know what you're doing. Like this is, no, you can't do it. You know, like literal screaming matches between generals in Tokyo at, at MacArthur's uh, planning table because the, the tac P's or the, the fifth air force commanders, like, sir, we can't, you can't do that. This is not how this works. B-29 should not be dropping bombs within 100 yards of, of friendly troops. Things this might is a go bad, bad idea. And then MacArthur <laughs> overrode them, and we had a hundred, hundreds of friendly casualties. And then General, the general who was in command of the Far East Air Force, General Stratemeyer, says, Sir, I told you. And it's a very uncomfortable, I told you so. But then, you know, there was like... I don't know how much time you've got, but I can go on Korea for a while. So. To hop on in, man. All right. Well, if, and continuing in that thread as we as we continue, um, the the cast in Korea was weird because we were in the um, the evolution away from the the rotary or from the the rotor days to the jet age, and the jets that we had at the time were really designed for air interdiction, so we didn't or not air interdiction, air superiority. And they really weren't designed for the close air mindset. So as Korea kicked off, we had to pr pull some planes from World War II. We were using, used to be called P-51s at the time, were called F-51s. Those were our CAS platforms. And so as CAS continued to go in and we were bringing in TACPs, TACP teams all the time, we couldn't figure out exactly what the best way to go. And then at the same time, we were having a massive push from North Korean and, and Chinese forces to what was called the Pusan perimeter. This was early on in the war around September-ish of 1950. Pusan is a small is a city on the southern end of of the Korean peninsula and that was pretty much it. That was all that the UN and American forces had. And well, as this was going, the um the planes were eventually having to fly from Japan so they didn't have a lot of loiter time. They were trying to figure things out. But the controllers kept kept working, and they were coordinating between the T six plane, the Mosquitoes, the Fac A, and the, the guys on the ground. And eventually, they were able to secure enough space where they could land planes there in Pusan, load them up, and then the, the ammo troops could watch as those explosions were going off because they were that close. And so, like these guys are controlling thousands upon thousands of pounds of ordnance coming off of planes, and then eventually. One of the most contentious generals of MacArthur's staff, General Almond, his name is, is it's crazy because he's a, his name's a nut and he was a nut. Um, but he happened to go to like the equivalent of Air War College back in the day. And so he had an Air Force Air Observer rating. So he liked to think that he knew CAS better than Air Force knew CAS and said, you guys don't care about CAS. And then when his when he got put in charge of 10th Corps. He was able to get USMC uh, air wing support. So for anyone who knows, the Marines do airs differently. It's all coordinated and combined within a task force. When he was like, well, why can't I have that? Why can't you Air Force dudes do this? And to which the general had to say, well, we do, but you're not doing it right, which is always the whole thing. And it's like kind of ties in with some of the liaison things that we do as TACPs is the hardest part is like, hey, sir, I, I know you want this thing, but like, this is how it needs to get done because if we want it, then we have to do it this way. And it's just like trying to battle and educate and trying to do it in the most diplomatic way possible. And sometimes you just want to grab them by the shoulders and say, sir, stop it. Just listen. But like, it's fun to, to kind of see these through lines that are continuing to go on. Well, but I was going to say, yeah, they, they yeah. still, we still have disagreements between the air force and the Marine Corps. Like they, their, you know, idea of fires is so much different than ours. Uh, they are they are stricter. They are more constrained, whereas the Air Force is more of like, you know, hey, don't don't overly restrict me. Don't restrict me if you don't mm -hmm. have to let me do my thing, because then I can make sure that my aircraft is more survivable. It's just I mean, well, we, and, nobody's surprised that the Marine Corps is more stringent. <laughs> well, and the, the part of it, too, is that the coordination and, and and communication between the services was really difficult because there's some terms that are 
they're slightly different than how he's using now. So like they had a jock, a joint operations center, but it was kind of more, it was actually an air force run organization and it was a combined, you know, the typical thing you would think, but it was mostly to coordinate air support. And so the Navy decided, no, nah, we ain't going to talk to you, bro. We're going to do our own thing. We're just going to, we're going to do continue to do sorties of every aircraft off an aircraft carrier is going to go. And as one sortie, we're going to, Oh, and the Marines, they're only going to talk to the ground force commander that they're attached to. And so it's like, they, it was, it was totally wild and like trying to, and it wasn't until like literally the last month of the war that the task force 77, the Naval, the Naval um, task force that was there in the Marines actually sent liaison officers to the jock so that they could coordinate airstrikes together. And it's just like, because it was really Korea that kind of saw the invention of our modern tax ag system. I'm not going to nerd out on that because I don't want to put everyone to sleep. Um, <laughs> I do nerd out on that. But the tax ags is... It's brutal. All you tax P's and, and controllers are going to learn that stuff here. Trust me. <laughs> but it's, it was a creation of a system. We didn't know how to, how to send from a tax P on the ground with a battalion commander. How did we send up an air request? And then how did we get that plane to that controller? So this was created through the process of things of like the tactical air direction center, the tactical air control center, you know, all of these things that, you know, are terms that we are familiar with now that are really just kind of tucked in the back of our head that we don't even think about. But someone at some point had to be like, hey, how do we do this? And it was here in Korea that we did it, right? I, I found, I know I posted it on, on the Instagram for the FSPEC war history. I found the, like the very first joint training document in close air sport. And it's wild. It is so crazy. Like it has everything down to what echelon attack P can be assigned to who's, who's allowed to control. It was, it's unbelievable that these, you know, the things that we, we think of and are completely left to just kind of like the back of our minds because it's become so ingrained in us. Like, again, it had to be created and these guys did it on the fly. With no direction. (laughs) With no direction. (laughs) Yeah. So eventually, you know, TACPs were with, were with the team, were with the units all the way from the beginning of the war to set up the, the, uh, early air support request nets, the, um, all the way to the end of the war when the armistice was signed in 1953. And I, I, technically they're still there today. You know, everyone's there, you know, jobbing it up. You know, some of my favorite pictures from Korea are, um, you know, some of the more modern stuff like funky Bunkley's page you know watching him and him post this stuff when he was in korea that was stuff was awesome i never got to go i wanted to but it was awesome so like oh. tac p was wild <laughs> like just thinking about like those guys were jobbing the whole time and just like couldn't i man it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> well wh- where are you at on a um on a on a pausing point Right well, we can, we can pause, right? That's a good pausing point because then it, we can just roll okay. into CCTs in Korea. Okay. All right. Th- then we'll pause here, uh, kind of end it, and then ske- get you scheduled for, for a round two just to, or a continuation, rather. Um, Sounds good. Just because we'll, we'll get going, and then we'll be uh, another, another 25 minutes in or something like that. And it's like, well, okay, now we're not at a good spot to, to stop. So, Morgan, appreciate you joining us. Thanks for the history lesson. Looking forward to getting you on for, for a part two. That way we can continue on into the history. I, I, I really do appreciate all the, all the work that you put into doing the research for this because there's a lot. I mean, I, I've learned a lot, and there's, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know that we were kind of – doing things like the the you know air force special warfare teaming and and all that kind of stuff i mean i've always known that we complement each other like it always made sense to me when i first got it like my first rotation i was doing csar stuff Mm -hmm. you know so we had you know me as the only controller and i had two pjs you know that that always made sense to me um and now that as we have adapted throughout the years it we've we've just gone right back to what it was mm-hmm. and uh and i dig it because we complement each other really well for sure yeah man all right well everybody out there don't forget to like subscribe hit the uh notification bell leave us a review too use chat gpt make it funny <laughs> use the right prompts just get it going and really <laughs> it just helps out and it's fun to read anyway 
So, all right, we're out here. Thanks. Thanks, Morgan. Hey.